Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, my guest is Sam Burns from Mill Street Research, coming to us from the Boston area. Sam's one of my favorite macro thinkers, so it'll be interesting to hear his take. As we're sort of in mid-January, the s and stalling a bit. It's what I'd call a digestion day. No real clear push higher, no real clear push lower, more digesting the gains from yesterday and previously. Technology pushing higher with energy at the bottom of the list. What does this mean overall in terms of sector rotation? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, investor psychology, supply, demand, fear, greed, all of those, uh, all of those great things that help us get a sense of the message of the markets. And again, in times of uncertainty, in which I've, I've, over my career of uh, 20 odd years, I've not seen a more uncertain stretch in terms of what we're all grappling with and just trying to make sense of, uh, of unique circumstances. But the message of the market remains uh, pretty consistent in that the uh, overall euphoria, desperation, optimism, pessimism, fear, greed, all manifests itself into prices. And if we can follow the trends, if we can understand price momentum, we can understand how buyers and sellers are motivated and where the opportunities might be. Our goal is to identify trends, to follow those trends, and to anticipate when those trends are exhausted. Now, we have some great guests along the way to help us make sense of the markets. I mentioned Sam Burns uh, coming to us from Mill Street Research today. Uh, excited to talk to him uh, a little later in today's show. Coming up next week on Tuesday, the 26th, we have Bruce Powers. Uh, Bruce is a longtime technical analyst, a fellow CMT. He uh, spent much of his career in Dubai, so has a unique perspective, uh, you know, really experiencing the, the meteoric growth of that region and uh, of Dubai in particular. I'd be interested to hear his sense of global markets as he joins us on Tuesday. On Wednesday, Julius de Kempener from, uh, coming to us from the Netherlands. He's the founder of RRG Research, a sector expert. And then on Thursday, uh, talking options, we have Danielle Shea from Simpler Trading coming back uh, on the show. So some fantastic guests coming up next week. As a reminder, tomorrow, uh, Friday's show is always a lot of fun. We wrap the week, go through the Mindful Investor live chart list and try to focus on the key themes that have evolved over the last five trading days or four trading days uh, uh, in uh, this week's case. Let's get to uh, our market recap. So uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, the S&P really choppy and I, and I tend to classify these as digestion days. And what think about is you eat the big meal and then you have to kind of digest it for a little, a little while, let things settle in. Then you're ready to kind of make, take, the, uh, take the next move of some sort. That's kind of what happened, right? You get a big rally yesterday, a nice improvement in stocks. And then today was sort of a uh, digestion day, sort of chopping around a midpoint, really didn't move materially off of, uh, of yesterday's close, sort of revolved around that area and ended up not far from where we started around 3850 uh, token uh, amount, a rounding error above, uh, above zero. The NASDAQ led the way higher and technology was the number one sector with the XLK up about one and a third percent. Uh, mid caps and small caps at the bottom end of this. So we had sort of a, a, a reversal of sorts, uh, you know, in the average day over the last couple of weeks, if not last couple of months, has been small over large. It's been materials, energy, industrials, financials over, you know, more value oriented spaces over growth oriented. Today, we're sort of back to what uh, things used to look like through much of 2020, which was growth over value, tech, consumer communication services, sort of the FANG trade, the growth trade over uh, value. Uh, and, and again, I, I, would, I would assume that's a temporary thing based on the trends that I've seen, but, but we'll have to see energy giving back a lot. And some of the biggest losers in the S&P, if you look at just price movements, if you look at um, you know, losing ground in the scooter rankings. It was a lot of energy, things like Devon Energy, Occidental, uh, ConocoPhillips on there. You can see Apache, a number of, uh, a number of names uh, within that sector down uh, four or 5% plus. Uh, let's go on to some other asset classes very quickly, then we'll look at some further charts. So bonds weakened a little bit further. It's after a rally in the TLT into yesterday's close, 
uh, back on the downside today, down 0.7%. The U.S. dollar continuing to weaken as well, back into that weakening, uh, weakened dollar uh, mode that we've been in for, uh, for a good amount. Gold essentially flat for the day. It was down through much of the morning, but rallied up and, uh, and closed flat for the day. Silver pushed higher uh, above zero. Oil price is a little weaker. And, and again, energy, as I mentioned, uh, pretty significantly lower. Cryptocurrencies continuing to be uh, as volatile as ever. But it's interesting to see things like Bitcoin really get back a lot of ground. Down to around 32,000 on, uh, on Bitcoin. You can see most, uh, if not all the, the ones in the top, uh, top 10 that we follow here. Uh, down in a pretty pretty good amount. So Bitcoin has really come down forty two thousand, down to thirty two thousand, in not too uh, in, in, a, in a pretty pretty close window of time. And the question is, at what point do you have to think about further downside risk on something like Bitcoin? We'll look at that chart if we have time a little later in today's show. You know, looking at a chart of the S and P again, we didn't move a lot directionally today, as I mentioned, sort of a digestion day. So I think that this trend line that we've talked about still very much one of the key guideposts I'm going to be following just to track this uptrend. You know, I'm not a huge user of trend lines as a trading tool, as a trading system, but I am a huge fan of using them as a way of visually representing the trend. You know, you've now connected a couple of lows here, three lows actually, the low from October, the low from the beginning of the year, and the low from uh, earlier this week. That sort of lines up this trend. This is actually Friday's close, I believe. Uh, and, and, uh, and if you line up those three low prices, we're now sort of tracking the trajectory of this upward trend. As long as that remains in place, as long as we remain above that trend line, we have very little to be concerned about because what that means is by definition, we're making higher highs and higher lows for that trend line to remain, uh, to remain stable. If and when we break down through that trend line, which will happen at some point, it could happen as early as tomorrow, of course, that would tell you at the very least there's a change in character. There's a bit of a rotation of sorts and you want to think about what that might mean and start to look for uh, uh, you know, risk assessment and look at individual sectors and, and stocks to see what sort of breakdowns you're potentially seeing there. Overall, the trend remaining pretty positive uh, across the board. Looking at some other asset classes here very quickly, you know, gold is an interesting chart. We've talked about it. I feel like anytime I'm ready to just very, very close to declaring that this is going to break out and, and hear the, uh, the beginning of the year, really the end of last year, we talked about breaking through this trend line. We talked about resistance uh, here around 183, 184 for the GLD. And, and the comment was, if we can get above that level, that clears the way to retest the previous highs, as you can see. We failed right there. We then broke down through trend line support. We then broke down through the 200 day, which tells me, all right, we're now going to get back down to 157, 158, which is retesting the lows from last summer, which is indicated by a breakdown. We've now reverted right back to the upside. So if you look, gold is really in consolidation mode. You have stable highs, you have higher lows, and this is a uh, an asset class that's really going nowhere since, you know, really since September. If you look there, if you if you take that first sell-off from August to September and then just draw a horizontal line, it's kind of where we spent most of our time rotating around that midpoint around 175, 176. We're kind of right in the middle there. So neither bulls or bears really taking control. You can see the RSI is almost exactly at 50, which would be, a, you know, a neutral reading, a true absence of momentum kind of there. So, uh, you know, you're waiting to see which side will uh, will take control. Uh, and, and again, I still say until we can break meaningfully above this resistance level, I don't think you can get too excited about long-term upside and goal. That would be the trigger, I think, that would clear the way uh, further to the upside. Again, it's breaking down through the 200-day and staying there that would, uh, that would propel uh, gold further down, uh, which would put, put, obviously, spot gold further down as well. I'm um, looking very quickly at interest rates here. So uh, we talked about uh, bonds uh, and uh, and moving a little bit weaker. I wanted to bring up the uh, the TLT is there. I wanted to bring up the ten year yield. So you know overall, I certainly have. We've talked about this rotation from a a pattern of lower yields, a pattern of higher yields. If you look at the relative strength of the financial sector, a major bank. Uh, we talked uh, earlier this week, if I remember right, about the ratio of Microsoft to Bank of America, I want to say. And, you know, looking at that ratio is an indication of sort of the growth versus value trade. The, the relative strength in financials really follows this appreciation in interest rates. And, and even though we've given a little bit back there, overall, it certainly seems that the trend remains positive for rates, lower for bond prices. And I think that continuation of that trend is what could certainly fuel the relative strength in financials going forward. It's been a bit of a, of a rocky uh, week this week, um, looking at something like uh, JP Morgan. A lot of these uh, stocks reported earnings last week, sort of last week into this week was 
uh, a lot of financials and you saw the rise in JP Morgan, you saw the break above 140. And then this week has been more about uh, giving it back. So overall, while the trend remains just, just fine, trend remains positive, higher highs and higher lows. If we draw a trend line from some of these recent lows, you can see we're actually breaking down through the trend a little bit, which is a cause of a bit of concern. I don't mean to make this bold face like it's the end of the world. Sorry, let's do this. Maybe a better representation of that, right? So I'm going to take the trend line. We're sort of right there. We really haven't broken down. If you take the low from October, take the lows in December, lines up with early January, we're sort of staying above there. So this is sort of a pullback within a legitimate uptrend. I think breaking trend lines like that would cause me to be a little more concerned than I am at this point. Overall, it seems like a bit of a pause that refreshes before you can resume uh, a little further up chance. That's something I would be looking for uh, on the uh, on the chart of JP Morgan and some of the other banks. What has done well in the number one group remains um, the renewable energy equipment group, which includes the solar stocks, uh, looking at TAN, which is the solar ETF, up almost 6% today, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice rally higher. And again, after a bit of a pullback there, continuing this move. So if you look, the price trend has been positive. The relative strength is what really impresses me about uh, this ETF and about solar stocks and that renewable energy equipment group. It's been a consistent outperformer and long-term outperformance on the relative chart overall are the types of charts you would most likely want to lean into. That is our market recap for today. I want to take a quick break back with Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's a pleasure to have you with us every weekday after the close as we debrief on the action of the day, try to connect the short-term movements to the long-term trends and understand how the trends are evolving. We are here to help you along the way. If you have questions that come up as you're analyzing charts, as you're trading, as you're uh, you know, using technical indicators, whatever it is, shoot us an email with any questions you have and we'll uh, address it perhaps on our next mailbag segment at the end of this week. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com, on Twitter at finalbarsctv, or on our YouTube channel, just put a comment right below the video that you're watching. I wanna welcome on uh, today's guest, Sam Burns from Mill Street Research. Sam uh, has been on the show a couple times. Sam, I always appreciate your perspective on the big picture. It's, it's always helpful to see what you're seeing relative to what the message of the charts. Welcome back. Oh, thanks, Dave. No, it's a pleasure to be back. So you're, you know, obviously, I, I think this condition, these conditions we're in with the market continuing to push higher, this potential reemergence of the FANG trade, walk us through how you're thinking about risk uh, in this sort of environment. Yeah, the thing that's really, you know, struck struck uh, you know me in terms of looking at this market has been the persistent leadership of the, the really the highest volatility stocks, the riskiest stocks uh, in the market, uh, both in the U.S. and globally. Uh, when we look at, uh, you know, some of the, the measures that we look at for high versus low risk, uh, it's been, you know, you know, pretty powerful from from the lows last year uh, in, you know, sort of March, April, and it's still going. There's really no signs of let up uh, in, in, the, in the appetite for risk. And that's, you know, that's normally, at least in the short run, a good sign for the market. And, uh, and it normally tends to, you know, provide further momentum, um, you, know, you know, at least in the near term. So we expect to th see things, you know, keep going for at least a little while longer, given this level of risk appetite. It does raise the question of, you know, when is, you know, when is it too much? When has sort of optimism gotten too high? Uh, but uh, for now, it looks like that sort of, you know, trend, uh, particularly in, in the higher risk stocks, you know, is still intact. And that top panel is a global high volatility index. I'm assuming that includes some U.S. and then some non-U.S. as well. That's right. That's our own sort of custom index where we take the top decile of stocks globally um, based on their, their trailing historical volatility and just look and see how that, that sort of portfolio of, of, of the highest volatility stocks globally, uh, U.S. and non-U.S., has performed. And you can see for a number of years going you know, into last year, uh, it really wasn't doing a whole lot. It kind of peaked in 2018. Um, and, uh, and then really, you know, kind of went down, bounced, you know, stayed in a range for most of 18 and 19 and got re hit really hard in February, March with everything else when COVID hit. And then from there, once all the policy, you know, started the fed and all the fiscal stimulus, they just went through the roof, um, <clears throat> you know, really got a big head of momentum going through, you know, probably June 
and then kind of paused for a little while, consolidated there. And then since early November, when the uh, Pfizer news, uh, the vaccine news hit, um, and then the election news, more election news, and stimulus news have all continued to sort of push that uh, that series higher. So, uh, you know, we, we look at things in terms of the U.S. a lot of times, but really globally, it's been a, a trend toward high risk stocks. And then uh, we can see the same thing there in the bottom section where uh, within the U.S. S&P 500, uh, the high beta stocks, uh, you know, the 100 highest beta stocks have outperformed uh, the low vol stocks. Um, again, since early November has been the second leg you've seen that's still in still going. Um, so you had the first big leg up through June and a pause and a second leg up since November. And it's broken out of that big you know, multi-year range now, you can see. And uh, it you know, tells you that there's been uh, you know, a lot of momentum behind high-risk stocks. People are willing to buy you know, risky stocks and get the most bang for their buck when there's uh, you know, a lot of liquidity, you know, a lot of free money floating around. Now, when most people think about volatility, obviously, Sam, they think about the VIX, so it's a, you know, sort of the fear gauge. Talk us through how this fits into your perspective. Right. So given all that we've seen with the enthusiasm for, for risk, you, you would expect to see all the signs of high optimism. I mean, you see a lot of them, but the one that's really stuck out that does not show that is the VIX. The VIX is basically, in our view, you know, too high given where realized volatility is. The market's volatility, the S&P 500, has been, you know, kind of 10 to 12 percent in the last month or two. But the VIX is holding, you know, above 20 and normally it does not have that that big a gap. That's an unusually wide gap. The VIX is sort of resisted going down, which tells us there's still a certain amount of uh, caution and kind of concern among options traders. They're not willing to you know to sell puts at low prices uh, to drive that kind of VIX down to where it would normally be. You see, in the past, it's normally tracked realized volatility much more closely, and so that tells us that there could be you know a little more upside uh, in in the stock prices. Uh, at least until the VIX kind of comes down closer to where realized volatility has been. Uh, of course, the alternative is that realized volatility does rise, which would imply, you know, stock prices correcting. Um, but uh, so far, we've still got enough momentum that that may, you know, may take a while to develop. So this is kind of one of the sentiment indicators that we track that is still bullish, that still does not show high optimism, uh, whereas, you know, some of the other indicators, like some of the, you know, the sentiment surveys and put call ratios and things like that do show optimism. So this would be an argument in favor of that risk appetite, you know, staying intact for a little while longer. So we only have about 30 seconds left, Sam, but I'd love to ask you mm -hmm. just, you know, we've talked about the, the FANG leadership, the, the FAN mag stocks, whatever we call them, that, you know, really led through much of last year. And then you had this rotation into things like energy, financials, industrials, really started to emerge. Now, you know, mm -hmm. FANG stocks have been sort of stagnant until this week. You're getting Netflix bouncing higher, Alphabet and others. When you're looking forward out a couple months, do you lean into more of the reemergence of the FANG stocks or do you lean more into the financial energy value sort of names that had been working going into the new year? Um, my guess is to some degree it will depend on, on policy and stimulus and things like that. They've really been a driver for a lot of those cyclical names. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, with earnings season now getting underway, um, you know, that, that there's going to be, you know, a greater demand for those secular growers as, as we go forward. I don't think interest rates are going to go a whole lot higher in terms of bond yields. Um, so I don't think that things like financials are going to have, you know, uh, a big long-term uh, secular uptrend in terms of performance. Uh, and the same thing with energy. I think that, you know, oil demand is going to be under pressure and certainly the politics are not as, as favorable for, for energy. I think we're seeing that today, actually. Yeah. Um, so I think that it, it's going to be a bumpier ride now that some of that kind of oversold conditions for a lot of those cyclical value type names have has been corrected. They, they are really beaten up last year a lot of way, in a lot of ways. And now they've kind of bounced back. So I think it'll be a little bit choppier for them going forward. And I think there'll be more you know, tendency to rotate back to the kind of longer term uh, growth names in, in some of the tech related areas. That's a great take. Sam, really appreciate you coming on, sharing some of your uh, thoughts with us. Hope you and those around you stay safe and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. It's a pleasure. That's Sam Burns, CFA. He's the founder of Mill Street Research outside of Boston. I, and again, I I love talking to people like Sam, who I feel like have just such a fantastic perspective and experience on what's driving things and where to look for opportunities. And I love that just that sometimes some of the most simple ratios, things like looking at high beta versus low vol and just recognizing the internal strength in that ratio and what that tells you about where people are making their bets and their appetite for risk, I think can be, uh, can be very, uh, very, very valuable. Appreciate Sam joining us today.
Our next segment is called Today's Chart List. This is one we haven't done in a little while, but what we like to do is just highlight uh, some of the ways that we use the, the chart list feature on stock charts, some of the ways we uh, you know, uh, re review sets of charts and how we organize them, because I have learned a ton from guys like uh, Grayson Rose, from Arthur Hill, Greg Chanel, Tom Boley, some of the guys I would consider power users of stock charts, uh, mentors of mine in terms of using uh, this platform uh, so much better. So I hope I can uh, share with you some of what I've learned from them really uh, in terms of what I use. So the way you get to your chart list, obviously you go to the member dashboard in the upper right, you have a chart list button. I have a ton of these because uh, for a while there, I've just, I've loved creating them, managing them, uh, looking at them, but I wanted to highlight one for you that I call uh, historical charts. And this is something I, uh, I started with uh, when I was at Fidelity, we have a Fidelity chart room and one of the great strengths of that space was looking at long-term charts going back, you know, in some cases, centuries, really focusing on the long-term trends. And it's so easy with real-time data, with nonstop uh, fire hose of information, social media, to just caught up in the short-term, what I call the flickering ticks of the market. And I find, I find that taking some time, some uh, focused effort to, to look at the big picture, look at the long-term and, and understand how trends have evolved over time, it can really, really help you center yourself on the time frame that you're trying to operate on. So basically what I did uh, a while ago was create a, a chart list called historical charts. And anytime I find something that helps me think about things in a long-term basis, I put it in here. And then with some you know regular frequency, maybe once a quarter, I'll make a point of going through all of these and just thinking about how the charts have evolved. I wanna highlight a couple of these for you. Um, the first one is gold and it goes back to the year two, uh, 2000. And the reason why I did this is, you know, when I'm looking at the trend in gold and you're looking at the strength in gold and really the weakness in gold in the last six months, you know, your one year chart is just this little area right over here. And that's, I usually look at a one year or a two year daily chart. It's kind of my standard, uh, or I might look at a five year weekly chart or something, but this is going back, you know, 20 plus years. And then you really understand the appreciation in gold prices, the rally that you saw into the peak in 2011, uh, when it uh, hit uh, just below $2,000 uh, an ounce, you can see how it then came down and, uh, and almost have that. And now you can see the return. And now this base that gold has made from 2011 down to 2015 and back up to break to, uh, you know, above 2000 uh, and now pull back to where it is, is significant. That's a huge rotation. You could go one step further and go even back to like 1980 and really understand the long-term trajectory in gold. But for me, it's a reminder to, recognize the fact that even though gold has been weak in the short term, we're still at or near, you know, multi-decade high, significant long-term highs in something like uh, gold. And it's a reminder to not get too caught up in short-term weakness. Remember the long-term growth story that gold has been in, especially since, uh, you know, for the last five or six years. Second example I wanted to show you, this is kind of a fun one, the uh, S&P career history. I actually put this I created this years ago uh, for a presentation where I, I um, uh, love to show my uh, bio in chart form. And this came, for, came from when I was uh, hiring for a junior uh, graphic designer at a firm I was at. And one of the people, the resume that immediately caught our attention, instead of doing a regular resume, basically drew a chart of the S&P 500 and overlaid bullet points of their career history on the chart. And I thought that was such a beautiful way of uh, of representing what they did. And so for me, it's always been the way I do. So I usually overlay logos of the firms I've worked over the last uh, 20 years. So I actually started in the industry in the middle of 2000, here in January of 2000, or June of 2000, excuse me. So if you know your market history, that was literally the, the tech bubble was bursting as I moved from the Midwest where I grew up to New York and, uh, uh, and started to learn how to invest. So if you ever get a sense that I'm more bearish than bullish on average, and I talk more about risk and things, it's because I learned technical analysis during 2000 to 2003, essentially. This is when I really learned the toolkit and talked to mentors and saw how people were using charts as a way of managing risk at a time that was incredibly uncertain. So, you know, while the market looks very different than it did during that period, I'm seeing a lot of the same uncertainty that you had, you know, after 9-11 and during this period where the tech bubble had burst, all of a sudden you had sort of a non-financial uh, you know, phenomenon that really affected things. There's a lot of confusion, uncertainty, and you know, you're getting a lot of that with the, with the uh, pandemic. So I, I'm, I'm not surprised that we had similar movements uh, during that period for sure. Um, so the reason why I do this is to reflect on some of these experiences that I've had. And, and again, depending on when you started, I would, I would encourage you to create a chart of the S&P, have it start at when you started in the industry or started paying attention to the markets, started investing for your own account. 
and look at some of these periods that you've been in and think about what some of those periods felt like. Think, some, think about how your toolkit has evolved. And when you see the market doing a certain things, I glance back to one of these periods that I've been in. What I tend to do is actually reach out to people I worked with at the time and catch up with them and talk about that period. It's helped me a lot to navigate um, some confusing times in, uh, in the markets. Another one I put in here is called Pepsi 2007 to 2009. It's one of my favorite examples of the 2007 peak. If you know how the markets topped out, right? We sort of rallied out of the 2002 to 2003 low, nice run up to a peak in 2007. And then we rolled over again and, 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 and had the financial crisis went into the 2009 low. But this period of 2007 is, is an interesting one, especially Pepsi, because if you know your market history, you know how the S&P chart looks like. It actually topped out in mid-2007 and started to roll over. But stocks like Pepsi, big defensive blue chip names, actually continued higher. It made a new high at the beginning of 2008. So it's a great reminder of what tends to happen at the end of a bull market phase when big stocks like Pepsi, sort of the defensive consumer staples types of names, um, tend to actually continue to do well. And if that's, your, uh, your, if that's what you're looking at, you'll think that the market's just fine. But remember, the more speculative stuff, going back to Sam Burns' comments, some of the higher beta names are probably rolling over already. So if you look at the chart of the Russell 2000 relative to Pepsi right about there, you'll see what I mean about the underperformance of uh, the higher beta names, the low vol, more sluggish, high yielding names like Pepsi actually did uh, just fine. Uh, that is, uh, that's all the time we have with it. I hope that was helpful. If there are any um, titles that you saw in here that you, you want me to share, I'm more than happy to share with them or any of the ones that I shared with you. Just give me the title of the chart that, uh, that I showed you and, uh, and shoot me an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. I'm happy to send you the links. You can save it to your own login. But I would encourage for you to set up a, a chart list called historical charts. Start to gather some of those charts that help you maintain a proper long-term perspective. I guarantee it's going to help you think appropriately long-term about the markets. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is Bitcoin. And again, I hesitate to go ragingly bearish on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, early, uh, it, sort of mid, late 2020, I, I came out with this uh, Bitcoin 37,000, which seemed outrageous at the time. And we blew right through it on the way to 42,000. What I'm noticing though, is if you think about the last, month or so, and you think of it as a symmetrical triangle of lower highs and higher lows, we've now broken through that trend line using the lows from uh, year to date uh, in January here. Uh, we've now closed below that, uh, that trend line. If you measure the height of that pattern, subtract it from the breakdown level, that gives you a downside objective of around 23,000, which is not far from the 61.8% retracement level of the uh, September to January run. And it also would line up with this swing uh, low from mid-December. So a lot of reasons why that could be a pretty reasonable objective given the volatility that we've seen, the height of the pattern and the breakdown. Again, it's all about a follow through through uh, tomorrow into this weekend and see if you get further down uh, downside pressure on Bitcoin. I think 20,000 would be a short-term support uh, in any case. That's chart number one. Chart number two is the chart of gold, as I mentioned. This is a confounding chart, uh, I, as I, I would describe it. I think the moment I start to think about we're getting a signal of further, uh, of further movement in a certain direction, it sort of reverts and goes back up. We saw a potential breakout to new swing highs uh, at the beginning of the year, which was repelled. We then saw a breakdown of the 200-day, which was also repelled. We're now midpoint of the range that we've been in for the last four months or so. I, something has to happen here. Either we break down through the 200 day and we, and we continue lower or we break out above these swing highs and push higher. I would be looking very closely at the movement of gold right now. It's telling you absence of trend, zero momentum. Finally, I'm bringing up the chart of United Healthcare, uh, UNH. Uh, and the reason why I bring up United Health Group is because this is one of those where if you focus too much on the price itself and not enough of your attention on the relative strength, you will get two different uh, opinions on this. If you look at the price chart and you see higher highs, you see higher lows, you see the stock above two upward sloping moving averages and it caught my eye because it just bounced off the 50 day. I'm looking at, I'm thinking, that's a decent chart. That's the kind of thing I, I, would, I wouldn't be uh, you know, afraid to hold. That's actually a decent uptrend. But if you look at the relative strength, it literally has gotten you nothing on a relative basis since the March low. On a relative basis, you're sitting much, pretty much right where you were there. And so don't forget, if you're focused too much on trend and not enough on relative strength, you'll miss the message of the relative performance. Folks, that is our show for today. Special thank you to Sam Burns from Millshirt Research joining us from Boston today. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.